Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, um, very excited to be here. And uh, uh, when I learned that uh, 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 this uh, organization is going to uh, start its 40th uh, Congress with, uh, uh, with uh, this debate, uh, it's, it's very exciting. I think it's uh, very much the right time to talk about uh, uh, open access to data, to research. Um, uh, first of all, uh, as we speak here now, uh, the world is celebrating uh, Open Access Week. Uh, is coordinated out of Washington, D.C., and uh, I encourage you to look at uh, their website. Uh, uh, the name is, as it says, on the can. Uh, and uh, uh, you will uh, find, uh, even within your own institutes, advocates that are actually currently doing all sorts of uh, awareness activities. Um, the second of all, um, why is this the right time? I think we are all involved into a, a set of very exciting uh, disciplines. Uh, under the, the blanket term marine science. And uh, marine science is uh, really relevant to uh, most societal challenges. Uh, we're only six weeks away from the Horizon 2020 uh, announcement. And uh, uh, directly or, in the, or indirectly, we, uh, we can and we do contribute to, uh, to most of those societal challenges. So um, there is a lot of con context there and, and, uh, uh, and reasons for all of our research, all parts of our uh, research uh, life cycle to be transparent, open, accessible, not just to uh, colleagues in underprivileged countries, but also to society at large and prepare society for uh, a policy underpinned by marine science. Uh, so, um, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Ivo Grigorov. I, uh, I am a trained marine scientist uh, and lately uh, uh, kind of took a left turn more into uh, research program management. Uh, my current project is uh, called Euro Basin. It's very much focused on North Atlantic marine ecosystems. Um, and when I get uh, bored with that job, I do a lot of uh, open science advocacy uh, within the marine and climate change community, and we try to train uh, the, the, the postdocs and the, the, the young recruits into uh, adopting many of those principles. Um, so um, uh, I mentioned Horizon 2020. Um, one, one last thing uh, before I kick off, uh, uh, open science uh, will not go away. It's going to be part of the Horizon 2020 mandate. Uh, but this presentation is not really about mandates and what you're supposed to do as scientists. Uh, hopefully this presentation is more about uh, what you could do to uh, improve your uh, research uh, life cycle uh, and to improve your personal impact and your research assessment profile. And in doing so, actually uh, improving the, the visibility and the impact of our, of our uh, set of disciplines. So uh, let's start just with a little, of, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, definition and semantics. Um, we talk about open science. What is open science? It's a blanket term and it covers uh, each step of the research uh, life cycle. And it starts with, uh, of course, uh, with data. That's where our most, uh, most of our work starts, generating data, making sense of it, uh, producing scientific research in the form of papers, reports, advice, uh, and, and also taking it a step further, actually uh, digesting that uh, knowledge, that codified knowledge, uh, in terms of dissemination for the general public. And uh, the open science movement decide, uh, defines itself uh, as, as such, making all parts of that research uh, uh, easily and freely accessible to all levels of an inquiring society, be they uh, professional or amateur. Um, so uh, let me start with uh, first a, a pretty image. What you see here is not the uh, the Earth uh, uh, at night. Uh, it's not the the uh, f uh, flight paths of uh, various air companies. This is a, a recent uh, image uh, published, I think, uh, in the last two years, uh, and it basically maps the scientific collaborations. Uh, across the world. And I'm very happy to see this because at the moment I'm working on North Atlantic ecosystems, so this golden uh, bridge of, uh, uh, which doesn't actually show very well, um, how do we point here? Yes. Uh, what you, what you sh should be seeing here is uh, uh, an arch of collaboration between these two continents, and uh, that's thoroughly a good thing. But uh, it would be easy to look at this image and run away with uh, a single message, that uh, the, the, the collaborations are uh, a factor of GDP, for example. Uh, if we look at the uh, area that uh, this uh, organization and this community is interested in, uh, everything is fine in, in Europe, but the Mediterranean really forms a, 
uh, a bit of a chasm in terms of uh, collaboration. So does that mean that on the other side of this basin there, there aren't uh, brains to be interacted with and, and, and good science to be done? So I think we need to be careful that we don't run, don't run away just with this message. Uh, there is another underlying message, and that's that there are many barriers uh, the obvious one uh, being resource, resource access to, to research papers, access to data, uh, access to all parts of uh, the uh, research uh, uh, life cycle product. Uh, and if you don't believe me, there are many colleagues here from the uh, underprivileged universities, from, under, uh, from underfunded uh, uh, institutes. Uh, I encourage you to uh, 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 talk to them uh, and you will find out that uh, frequently access to just simple papers is a problem. Uh, and, and, and that's really uh, uh, not advancing our, our cause. Um, just a bit of background. Um, uh, the reason uh, I uh, got into this was really this statement uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, a, uh, a librarian at the University College uh, London did this uh, internal study uh, just to, uh, out of curiosity to find out how much of the uh, academic uh, uh, research publications are actually accessible to the outside world, to the outside of the walls of the university. And he came up with this number, uh, and it's 60%. So I'll let you judge this, uh, how good this is. Um, ten years later, the European Commission uh, funded a similar study, but they wanted to make it official, statistically valid, and look at um, the European landscape as well as the, the, the worldwide uh, uh, the world as a whole. And the results were this. Around 50% of scientific papers are now free for anybody to text mine, use, uh, read, understand outside of, of, of the academic sphere. Uh, is this good or bad? I mean, one obvious question that this poses is, what happens to the rest? Imagine yourself, uh, you uh, invest a lot of blood and tears into uh, producing data, analyzing it, uh, hopefully making data papers, on top of which you will be build research uh, uh, publications, and only one out of two is accessible to the audience that you want to reach. Is that accessible at a personal level? And is it accessible if you are uh, on top of an organization, a research organization? Is it access uh, 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 acceptable that only uh, half of the effort actually makes it outside the physical walls of the institute? Um, here's a, um, uh, also a, a bit of an experiment uh, that I run uh, myself. Uh, there's nothing sophisticated about this. I just decided at the end of uh, each of those years, uh, to behave uh, like a, a curious citizen, use Google Scholar, and find out on two particular topics which were uh, uh, very um, topical at the time, and badly spelled, by the way, um, uh, how much of the research is, is uh, actually accessible to a citizen uh, outside using uh, something like Google Scholar. And on ocean acidification and geoengineering at the time, uh, uh, two topics that were becoming very popular, you could see that the uh, number of publications was rapidly increasing. So how much of that do you think was actually accessible to anybody who cared to read it? Uh, there was a lot of discussion in the media and the, the public was very interested in the topic. So we can't say that uh, non-scientists do not care about this. And uh, I think I think it would be wrong to assume that they don't understand what we do and they can't understand the papers we actually produce. I think that would be a wrong message to, uh, a wrong attitude to adopt. So the result was something like this, and um, not many. Um, it, it, I think it came down to less than 40% on average. There was a trend uh, uh, with time uh, that improved, and I think uh, for the last three years it's much better than this. But still, um, it, it, why aren't we, uh, uh, by default, uh, producing uh, open science if it's, societal, if it's relevant to societal challenges and if a society is actually curious and talking about this. So um, I think there's many personal individual benefits of doing so. And let me just, uh, let's do an experiment together. Pretend you close your eyes and uh, uh, hold my hand and let's walk you through your uh, potential uh, research workflow five or ten years from now. Everything, of course, starts with an idea, but you are here at this meeting, so uh, you definitely don't like ideas. You don't like uh, uh, ideas on hypotheses to test and, and science to do. So in 10 years from now, how would you or could you uh, do better than you do now? <clears throat> well, everything starts with an idea, so uh, you start running experiments, you start testing, uh, you do trial and error. But while you do that, you don't take physical notes in a, 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 a piece of paper which you stand to lose. You actually do it on something called open notebook science. 
fancy term, nothing more complicated than a blog. Why do you want to do that? Because while you're doing your trial and error, you're actually inviting the community uh, that you know and that you don't know into your trials and errors. And uh, you're getting feedback, and they're giving you ideas you never thought of, and they're making suggestions. And your trials and errors are now more uh, uh, efficient, they're, they're quicker, you have more ideas, you actually form collaborations that you couldn't have expected. This you couldn't do if your uh, uh, notebook is stuck into your drawer and only you can read or understand it. The next thing you do, you gather some data, you want to make sense out of it, you write a simple model code. And you don't keep it again to yourself, you actually uh, 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 publish the, the modeling code through uh, open uh, uh, source platforms. Uh, the code is explained, anyone intelligent can look at it and understand it. Why do you do that? You share it because there's a sea of citizen scientists out there, enthusiasts, uh, various backgrounds, various interests, that actually could understand and could help, could help you with it. And I'll show you an example uh, later on. The next thing you do is, you're using your simple model and you're making more sense of your data from your experiments, and now you have a more advanced uh, data product, which you actually publish. And this is nothing new. We're very good at this as a discipline compared to many others. We're very good at this, and uh, we have a number of uh, 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 data archives uh, from atmospheric science to, to marine biology to uh, genomics to you name it. And uh, not only that, we have three very good data journals. Uh, I encourage you to, to, to find out how these data journals work. Basically, uh, uh, you could imagine doing a literature review on a new topic you started. You, you gather all the data, uh, and, and you... Um, apply some uh, uh, quality protocols, and now you reach uh, a more advanced data product. Now this makes a data paper before you start uh, introducing it into models and, and really uh, writing a research paper. Uh, and all of those uh, 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 journals uh, have an impact factor. They're all peer-reviewed. Uh, they're all open access. Now, the next step is you go into the traditional publication, the research publication. And, um, and you do that how? You do it through open access. At the moment, I hear people here uh, talking about uh, the author-funded uh, uh, method, that open access is expensive, it costs two to $3,000 per paper. We don't all have that kind of money. And sure enough, not for all of our papers. There is an alternative. It is supported by funders, and it's called self-archiving. Self and uh, it has been going on in the uh, uh, physics, theoretical physics field uh, for 50 years. So nothing new there. Um, it's good to look sideways to other disciplines, how they do practice and how uh, they get uh, um, uh, uh, benefit uh, out of these uh, practices. So if you feel uh, a bit uncomfortable with open access, the next one might uh, feel you even, make you feel even more uncomfortable. Um, what you might not be able to read here in uh, this image, uh, what it actually says is negative and proud of it. And uh, what this is, is a journal uh, that f uh, to, publish op uh, to publish negative results. Why do you want to do that? Um, you, f you failed on something. But if you actually apply the right protocol, it's a, publish a publishable uh, uh, piece of work. And why do you want to do that? Because it saves money and time and effort for someone else not to do it. Um, and and it, it, again, it's an open door to uh, collaborations that you never heard of. And you're doing this because you've looked at other disciplines. And in the medical research and in the pharmaceutical research, uh, they're investing lots of money into building databases on negative results because it saves time, money, uh, and it advances the, the, the general science. Now, you don't stop there. You've published all your papers, you've published all your data papers. Now you want to engage the world out there and explain it to them in simple terms. And you're engaging the social networks. Why do you want to do that? Because it carries on the conversation. It's like this meeting, but in multiplying the, the number of uh, 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 targets. And um, the, the, the social networks also carry open educational uh, resources now, which have totally changed. Uh, the landscape of uh, higher education. Uh, and the reason you want to do that is because it engages the citizens. It invites smart, clever people into your science uh, to help in. And the funders are very keen on this. Uh, and uh, the next uh, uh, step is that we're probably not so familiar with, and it sounds a bit like a gimmick, is uh, crowdsourcing, uh, basically uh, 
projects like Kickstarter and so on, uh, where you might have a small project that requires a little bit of funding to do a, an expedition or a, a very focused study. We're not used to it, but again, funders are very keen that we in the marine sciences uh, get involved into these things. And uh, here in red are marked uh, some of the... Um, this is not a dream, of course. Now all of these uh, uh, steps are possible. And um, I need to wrap it up. Yes. So let me uh, let me just uh, go quickly. Uh. No, 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 no. Just let you know that it should be an end. Yes. Um, so the reason we want to do this is uh, because uh, applying open science principles to your uh, research workflow actually multiplies serendipity. And here are two examples. They both come from the uh, medical sciences. A teenager of 16-year-old who has discovered uh, uh, a new way to diagnose pancreatic cancer. How did he do that? He used Google Scholar. How cool. Uh, it would be nice if someone did that with us, with the marine sciences. Here's an example closer to our field. Um, this is uh, a model uh, written by Jim Hansen, a scientist you may have heard of uh, lately. Uh, and it's the, uh, a model of the surface of the temperature of the Earth uh, over the last uh, 100 years. Um, a bunch of computer scientists grabbed this model and improved it, made it 40% more efficient. And on this graph, what you don't see, there's actually two graphs, but they overlap so well. One is the original uh, model and the other one is the replication of the model by citizen scientists with a now model so efficient that uh, actually the uh, 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 originators of the model uh, are, are hoping to uh, adopt that new version. So uh, these are all dreams in a way to you, but uh, what I offer to you uh, in the next two minutes and I will close, um, what I offer to you is a way to implement this in a tangible terms into your workflow. And uh, here is a project that's funded by the European Commission that I'm involved in. And uh, I can't tell you what it's called, but I can explain to you the concept. And I encourage you to keep an eye on uh, uh, over the next uh, two weeks. Um, basically, what the concept is, we're trying to change this attitude from uh, uh, publish or perish to share to flourish with the future marine scientists. And to do that, we're the future marine scientists uh, of tomorrow is the, the graduate of today, and we want to really capture their intention and show them how they can improve uh, their research work workflow and, and make it more open and accessible. And of course, we can't target just the, the graduate students. We need to target the staff that really nurture them to maturity. And at some point, these graduate students will be involved in EU and national projects, and we'll be supporting the project managers and explaining to them why open science actually is good for your program, as well as for your institution. And uh, uh, we're going to support the, the staff that actually uh, deal with information science. And of course, we don't want to forget the research institutions, because that's where we are all embedded, and that's what we want. We need to serve on a daily basis. And of course, not to forget the funders. So, uh, with that, my closing remark is uh, the following: um, the, the uh, scholarly publishing has really undergone a lot of uh, changes lately uh, into the internet world. Uh, we are in a transition mode from the paper age into the in internet world, and that's causing a lot of um, a lot of us to be nervous. We don't know how to react. But my message to you is that we, as a marine uh, community, we are very well trained to deal with uncertainty, all sorts of uncertainty. Uh, this morning, uh, uh, Joachim Tintore mentioned uh, uh, we don't have the basis, the baseline data, we don't have the synoptic data, so why don't we just give up? Every time uh, we do an experiment with huge uncertainty, and many of our experiments have huge uncertainty, uh, every time we uh, use a model, it has huge caveats and huge uncertainty. That doesn't stop us from running in forecast mode and making a best intelligent guess. In fact, it motivates us to jump in and reduce that uncertainty. And I invite you all to take that skill set and apply it to your uh, research publication workflow and uh, not only improve uh, your own research assessment profile, but also make uh, our collective, uh, uh, a collection of disciplines more visible and more impacting. So with that, thank you for the invitation and thank you for your attention.